Hi everyone, welcome to Kim Help ASAP. In this problem set video, we are going to be working with a heating curve. Now, instead of doing multiple small problems, we are actually going to do a larger problem that involves all parts of the heating curve, and we are gonna put it all together at the end. Let's take a look at our problem. Here is the page with our problem, and it reads, a 50 gram sample of isopropanol vapor at 90 degrees Celsius needs to be cooled to a solid at negative 100 degrees Celsius. How much heat in kilojoules must be removed from the sample? Over on the right, we have our heating curve, which actually in this case, I think would be more appropriate to call a cooling curve. On the y-axis, we have temperature measured in Celsius. On the x-axis, we have heat. So as we move from left to right on the x-axis, we are actually removing heat in this case. You'll notice on the y-axis, we are given two very specific temperatures, 82.6 and negative 89 degrees Celsius. That corresponds with these plateaus here, which means it corresponds with phase changes. Now this 82.6 is going to be our condensation point where we move from vapor to then liquid, and our negative 89 is going to be our freezing point, where we go from liquid to solid. Um, these are also the same as melting point and boiling point, but in our case, we are removing heat, so we are gonna condense first, and then we are going to freeze. But the numbers would be exactly the same. Notice the shape of our cooling curve here. It has five distinct regions. I'm gonna call these one, two, three, four, and five. Regions one, three, and five correspond with temperature changes, and regions two and four correspond to phase changes. We have also been given a very handy table of physical properties of isopropanol, which we will be using in our calculations. Let's start with region one. This is where we're gonna take our vapor that's at 90 degrees C, and we are gonna cool it down to the condensation point. Here's my equation. I, I did label this Q1 so that we know what section it corresponds to. I know my mass for my problem is 50 grams. I need my specific heat. This is where having a table is really handy. I need the heat capacity of the gas, so I wanna make sure I choose the correct heat capacity. So I'm gonna use 1.54 joules per gram times Kelvin. Then I need my change in temperature. Now the nice thing about Kelvin and centigrade is in this context, I do not have to convert my Celsius to Kelvin. Of course you can, but you will get the exact same value for delta T that I get by plugging in my Celsius. So my change in temperature, again, I'm starting at 90 degrees C and I'm cooling to the condensation point, which is 82.6. I just do a little plug and chug and here I get a value for Q1. On to Q2. Now, in section two, we are undergoing the condensation process. Our temperature is not changing. You can see that in the graph. That's why we have a horizontal line. So I cannot use Q equals MC delta T. I must use for Q2 my number of moles times my heat of vaporization. If I come back to my table of my physical properties, here is my heat of vaporization. It is in kilojoules per mole, which is great because I am using moles. I simply plug in my number of moles. Here's my heat of vaporization, and I get a value for Q2, 36.6 kilojoules. So physically at this point, I have liquid isopropanol at 82.6 degrees. On to section three, this is where I'm gonna take my liquid and I'm gonna cool it from 82.6 all the way down to the freezing point, which is at negative 89 degrees Celsius. Again, because I am changing temperature, my Q3 is simply Q equals MC delta T. Again, I have my mass, my specific heat in this case, comes from, again, my table. I am using a liquid here. 
So I'm using the specific heat 2.68 joules per gram times Kelvin. And my change in temperature, again, is simply my change in temperature from my condensation point all the way down to my freezing point. Now, just be careful here, especially if you're using Celsius, that is a negative 89, so you want to make sure you get that negative in there. Quick plug and chug, and Q3 is 2.30 times 10 to the fourth joules. Let's get a little more space and continue on with Q4 and Q5. I'm going to put my regions in again. So here I have one, two, three, four, and five. Of course, we've already done one through three. We really just want to do four and five here. So for Q4, again, this is a phase change. My temperature is not changing, so I cannot use Q equals MC delta T. I must use the heat of fusion. So here is my equation for my phase change for Q4. Again, if I go to my table, here is my heat of fusion. It gives me my number right here in kilojoules per mole. So plugging and chugging into my equation, I get a value for Q4 of 4.39 kilojoules. Finally, my last region, Q5, now I have a solid at negative 89 degrees Celsius, but my problem wanted me to cool it all the way down to negative 100 degrees Celsius. So I'm gonna take my solid and I'm gonna cool it from negative 89 degrees Celsius down to negative 100 degrees Celsius. This does involve a temperature change, so my Q5 is MC delta T. I go to my table to find my heat capacity for my solid right here. I plug this number in for C. Again, my delta T here, I'm going from negative 89 to negative 100 degrees Celsius, so make sure you get those negatives in there so your delta T is correct. Now you may have already picked up that I have a problem here in this calculation. I have 50 grams, but in this case, my specific heat is actually a molar heat capacity. You can see I have moles down here. So these will not cancel. I need to have those units cancel so that I am just left with joules at the end of my calculation. So I am gonna convert my 50 grams into moles, which I've already been using for my phase changes. And now you can see my moles will cancel. Obviously my Kelvin is going to actually cancel with my Celsius, so I am just left with joules. Now I can plug and chug, and I can get a value for Q5 as 1.94 joules. We are almost finished with this problem, but it did ask us how much heat in kilojoules has to be removed from the sample. So far, we have only calculated the heat that needed to be removed for each of these steps. Let's put it all together and see how much heat has been removed from this entire sample for this whole process. So the total amount of heat is simply the sum of all of the steps that we have done. So in our case, we had five steps. So our Q total is simply the sum of Q1 all the way through Q5. So you can see in this step here, I have simply plugged in the numbers that I have gotten for each of my steps. But here I have another unit issue. Some of these units are in joules and some are in kilojoules. I cannot add those together as they are. I am gonna convert all of my joules to kilojoules. So here is my Q total. All of my units are the same, we're all kilojoules. I simply add those all up and I get a total value for the heat that has been removed from this sample. There you go, all five sections of a cooling curve. In this case, although of course you could do this with a heating curve as well if you're heating a sample up. Thanks so much for watching and I hope you found this helpful.